Our next session is uh, political policy in context. And I'm sure most of you will agree that politics and policy may sometimes drive us as red meat, meat, red meat producers and processors to the point of despair. But there is no hiding from the importance of these two in shaping the operating environment that we, that we operate in. This afternoon we have two um, really, um, really informed speakers who really command this space. Our, our first speaker, uh, Corinne Dan, will be familiar to many of you. Prior to co-hosting Radio New Zealand's flagship morning news show, Morning Report, Corinne was hosting TVNZ's Q&A show. He has over 20 years' experience as a journalist, including nearly six years as One News political editor and three years as host of TVNZ's daily business show. He lives in Wellington and with his wife Lotta and has three sons. So I'd really like to welcome uh, Corin to the stage. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I don't have much of any sort of slideshow or anything, so I'm just going to uh, rip into it. I just wanted to make a couple of comments on some of the things I've seen uh, today. Uh, I, great to see the speech from Pierre on uh, particularly chilled meat. Sounds a strange thing for me to say, but um, over the time as political editor, I went to China numerous times with John Key, and chilled meat seemed to be this thing that just cropped up all the time. He made some promise early on that he was going to... Um, somehow get more chilled meat into China, and it took a while to happen. And then every blinking press conference from then right through till a couple of years ago, my old mate Barry Soper, who was my boss at News Talk ZB, now my competitor, uh, he used to bang on at John Key about, when are you going to do something about the chilled meat? And uh, it was really nice to see <laughs> that the power of politics, call it what you will, that chilled meat is starting to have an impact well, I don't know what it was, 40 million or something up there. So it's nice for me to see that process. That, that was five years ago that would have first come up in one of those trips to China, in which we actually met Jack Ma as well. So it was quite interesting. Uh, we got managed to throw a couple of questions at Jack Ma back then, and it was very early days, the whole Alibaba stuff. But it's encouraging to see that uh, type of thing has, um, has expanded and grown. So that was really exciting. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, was just very briefly, because it caught my mind, was... Um, the speech by Jeff earlier when he mentioned about meat and the Oxford study saying not eating meat was one of the best things you could do for the environment. Um, that was funny because I was uh, hosting Q&A, would have been last year maybe, or might have been the year before, I can't remember, last year maybe, Sunday morning, and I had an interview with James Shaw scheduled. Uh, he would have been, uh, yeah, he was, must have been in government at that point, so uh, James Shaw... Green Party co-leader, live on the show, Q&A, and I was just about to go into the interview and I saw the story come through on the Guardian newspaper saying uh, the best thing you can do for the environment is, is give up red meat. And I said, oh, I sort of printed it out and put it, on the, put it on the, uh, in my pile of things to ask him about, and the interview was going nowhere. And I, I, I'm not, I'll say this, other people might have a different view, I'm not a big fan of got, the gotcha style of interview, that's never quite been my thing, but in this instance, I sort of, the interview wasn't going anywhere, and so I pulled out the Guardian study, just on a whim, and just said to him, oh, the study from Oxford says you should just stop eating meat, it's the best thing you can do for the environment, and you could see the blood drain out of his face. He kind of panicked, and it was one of those TV moments where he, he wasn't prepared, didn't know what to say, and you can see what's going on in his brain. He's going, right, uh, I probably believe that's true and you should stop eating meat and a lot of my supporters will believe that, but if I say that, I'm going to get in all sorts of trouble. It'll be a big political issue. He managed to sort of pull it around and say, well, if some people wanted to eat slightly less meat per week, then that might be quite a good thing to do. But it was a real moment, and it was, a, I suppose, a gotcha moment. But it also highlighted quite nicely the dilemma for uh, politics and, and some of these issues that are coming down the track uh, for your industry and for um, politics in general. Um, in preparing for today, uh, it occurred to me that it has been um, two years to the very day, the exact day two years ago, in fact, that um, I suppose I played my tiny little part in in the uh, last election 
um, cycle, if you like, because it was me who interviewed Andrew Little on this day two years ago. On a Sunday morning it was then, I think, or it might have been a Saturday morning, I can't remember. Anyhow, I had received a poll that day that showed Labour was on 24%. They'd had a couple of other rubbish polls before that, and Andrew Little had generally dismissed them. One, he said one of them was a rogue poll, and the billboards were already up, remember, at that point. He was running as the leader of the opposition. He was taking on uh, Bill English for the election. Um, anyway, I thought I was just going to grab a comment off Andrew Little about the latest poll and would move on. I'd do my poll story, Sunday night's news, 6 p.m. news, boom, Labour's on 24%, there you go. But somewhere along over the weekend, they said, oh, no, Andrew will come in for an interview. I thought, oh, that's interesting. So, he came, so I went, right, action stations, pulled out two big cameras, set up a big set, got him to come in. And it was in that interview two years ago today that he sat down and he said out loud, I have thought about resigning and I've talked to my colleagues about resigning. And at that moment, it was one of those moments where you go, boom, <coughs> knew it straight away. As soon as it came out of his mouth, knew it, he was gone. And two days later, Ardern, uh, the Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, took over. So it was probably going to happen, maybe it was going to happen anyway, but anyway, that was just interesting that it was two years ago at, at, at this day. So that's a good place to start in terms of where I think uh, the government is going and how it's going and how Jacinda Ardern is going. And one thing you've got to say about Jacinda Ardern is she's still uh, incredibly popular, still very good at connecting, and is got Labour from that 24% into the solid 40% mark in the poll, bearing in mind there aren't as many polls as there should be, so it's a little bit hard to tell, and we have to try and interpret leaks about internal polls and all these sort of things, but it seems pretty clear that Labour's in a solid mid-40s sort of position, and they were on 24% two years ago. So whatever you think uh, of Jacinda Ardern, that's a pretty impressive performance, and you've got to say that a lot of it, uh, if not all, is down to her uh, leadership, her ability to connect, the strong showing she's been putting in overseas, and the strong, certainly the strong showing um, after the Christchurch mosque attacks. The other thing I would say too that's not really, you know, putting aside whether you like what she's doing or not what she's, what she's not doing or whatever and that's not my job here today by the way I'm not here to say whether I think one policy is better or the other but nobody's talking about this being an unstable government. There's no sense that the government's going to collapse and fall and it's got no confidence and we're going to have an election tomorrow. So you've got to give her and her team some credit for that, and Winston Peters and James Shaw, that they have, in the first two years at least, created a situation where people have general confidence that the government's going to keep going for the full term. Now that isn't always a given when you've got Winston Peters on one hand, Shane Jones, and you've got the Greens. So it was reasonable to think that it wasn't going to be a stable. Well, they have achieved that. So that is a reasonable um, achievement. Um, the, for the support parties, um, yeah, I mean, I think that it's been an interesting arrangement because one of the ways in which Jacinda Ardern has managed to keep things going along nicely is she's given, she almost sort of seems quite relaxed if Winston or Shane Jones is kind of doing their thing. She's very tolerant and it sort of works and it gives them all a bit of oxygen. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing when you see the Greens and New Zealand first at each other's throats. They both get a bit of oxygen, but it's Labour stands above that, and they've been able to sort of go along, as long as it doesn't undermine that confidence or, or stability. Um, of course, there, there obviously has been a number of areas where uh, New Zealand First has exerted its uh, leverage, one, the biggest one being the capital gains tax, but others, and that has meant that, um, and there's probably many more that we don't realise um, but again, I think what's happened is that uh, that Labour learnt very early on uh, with things like a, the three, three strikes legislation, which Andrew Little said he had some cabinet authority to change and then got the rug pulled out and Winston didn't back it. They've learnt, they've learnt that to have this relationship working, they have to have everything ticked off altogether, all done before anyone sees anything. And so I think that's what we're starting to see now. Um, I think in saying all that, uh, you've got to say that the brand national still seems in pretty strong shape. Uh, this opposition has been pretty effective, uh, in my view. Uh, they've certainly held the uh, government to account very strongly on the issue of uh, Kiwi Build, which has um, certainly not been the success that 
this government had hoped for. Uh, they've been very effective in many ways, National, at uh, targeting ministers and holding them to account. So brand national remains somewhere in the 40s, perhaps slightly below 40%. We don't know exactly, but I think if you're a, 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 in, the, in national, you'd be pretty happy with that, given the, that in past cycles we've seen opposition parties fall right away. Uh, this hasn't been the case this time round. Um, obviously, the issue for national, there is an issue around... Uh, the leadership, and that continues to be an issue. Uh, Simon Bridges doesn't have the X factor quality necessarily that Jacinda Ardern, or the cut through the likability, if you like, that um, Jacinda Ardern seems to have. But I do think I'm not in the camp that thinks that it makes much sense in national replacing him. I don't think that there are that many viable options. I think that they're better off trying to st sticking with him. I think he's getting better, he's performing better, his interviews are getting better, and he's certainly got a pretty focused um, a pretty focused team in terms of the way in which they're targeting their media strategy, in terms of their targeting. I think it comes with some risks, but they're getting under the government's skin. So in terms of an opposition, you've got to say it's a strong opposition as well. So it's a little bit unusual because if you think in the last couple of government cycles, the opposition have tended to fall away, not this uh, time. Um, as for, yeah, but I guess we heard a bit about this with the National Party's conference over the weekend. The big problem for a national or dilemma remains friends and those allies to get them across the line. And they have to decide whether they're going to rule New Zealand first in or out. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many in the party who would like to rule New Zealand first out, and I know that there are those in the media and um, parts of the National Party that are encouraging Simon Bridges to say that's it, won't work with New Zealand first, therefore force Winston to have to stay with Labour and the Greens. I, I don't think they will. They might, I don't know. My opinion is I don't think they will. I think that they'll have to leave New Zealand first as the last cab off the rank. They've got to go into this election uh, campaign somewhere in the 40s so that they are seen as a credible uh, government and then hope that um, they get enough to get there alone. If they don't, they need to have the backstop of New Zealand first. Given that we are seeing ACT struggling to get more than one MP, they might be able to scrape two MPs if they did really well. I don't think there's any sign that a Christian Conservative Party is realistically going to get to 5%. Might be proved wrong, but it's getting pretty late in the cycle. Alfred Naro, the National MP, he had a wee bit of a look, uh, tested the waters. That didn't. He came back to National very quickly. Um, you know, you might think there would be some scope for that, given the uh, euthanasia, cannabis reform, abortion, a, a number of conscience issues are out there, but I'm just not sure that there's uh, anyone out there who can galvanise that Christian support in order to provide that on the right for national. So that issue of MMP remains a problem for them, um, but as I, as I say in the end, I think they'll have to leave Winston in the mix. For his part, pe people might say, well, why would Winston want to work with national? There's all this bad blood. Um, I think on balance you'd, you'd have to say he, he's probably more inclined to want to keep working with a second term Labour government on balance but I am sure that he will go into this election campaign making it very clear whether it's, whether it's right or not, he, he will convince us that he could go with National and that is his great genius, he will convince, he'll convince everybody in the entire country that he could go with either National or Labour once again as he has done for 20 years and we will end up believing him and then he will do his other great genius which is um, extract a fantastic deal off whoever he, whoever he goes with. So I think um, what that means is we, you know, it, it will be once again at the moment it looks on balance as if Winston will once again be a very key player uh, in the next election. Um, where this government has been criticised the most and challenged the most is probably around its delivery of these transformational policies which uh, it has promised. Uh, tackling poverty uh, is a big one, obviously. Uh, housing has been the big one that they've, they've really struggled on with Kiwi Build. They are building more houses, to be fair. They are building a lot more state houses. Um, but they haven't been able to, to live up to the expectations around Kiwi Build and affordable housing, which is what they promised to do. There will be a reset uh, in a couple of weeks' time once Megan Woods has uh, got fully up to speed now that she's in charge. And it'll be really interesting to see how they pitch that, how they brand that, whether Kiwi Build's gone and completely uh, or whether they, you know, whether they give it a new name, whatever they do. That's going to be a pretty critical moment because, because they have struggled 
with transformational, some of these big policy changes they want to do. They've, they may be, they need a few more runs on the board. You get the sense they'll be looking for a few more. Otherwise, uh, they run the risk of looking, um, I think it was someone said to me the other day, that Blairite or sort of a middle way where they haven't been able to uh, nail down some big transformational policies. There is the mining, to be fair. They've done their no mining ban, uh, future offshore mining. Um, but, of course, the big one was the capital gains tax, and they couldn't get that through. Um, so, and I think you are starting to see now some shifting of the language, or, or I think you will see some shifting of the language from Labour uh, over the next wee while, where it will be, there will be no less sense of ambition or intent to do, or do some of these big changes uh, but they will talk about needing time to finish the job and having struggled with complex intergenerational issues um, and they need more time and that may be a feature of how they look to campaign. The other area where I've noticed just a little bit of language starting to change uh, has been, I think I saw Jacinda Ardern talk about this a week or so ago about um, the squeezed middle and starting to recognise cost of living pressures on the middle. Um, emphasising that there'd been a lot of effort on well-being, on poverty, on homelessness, these sorts of issues where Labour has, was elected to deal with, had, has put a lot of effort. Um, they are obviously conscious, perhaps, that they're starting to get uh, under some pressure over the cost of living on the squeezed middle, and maybe they'll have to address that in the, in the budget next year. It, is it impossible that they would look at some sort of tax bracket changes, something like that? I don't know, maybe it is, maybe it's, that's too, too far for them, but uh, I wouldn't think that that could be completely ruled out. Um, the biggest, probably actually to be fair to them, the, probably the biggest area of transformational change in some ways where they have laid down groundwork at least is on climate change. And yeah, this is a really, uh, really interesting area of politics right now at this exact moment and particularly for the National Party and I'll get to that. I think this was the uh, nuclear free moment for Jacinda Ardern and James Shaw. I think you've got to give them credit in the sense that they have delivered a carbon zero bill. It's the framework for getting to um, carbon zero in 2050. As I say, it's a framework. It's, the, it's laying out uh, the, the Climate Commission. It's, it sets up the work for the carbon budgets. Uh, the debate, of course, is about how far it will, um, or how much it will penalise people for em emissions. And there's obviously a huge debate now in the New Zealand economy, which I think is good, that it is starting to really come up, and uh, which is around who pays the cost of the transformation, where does the cost fall? And I know I'm sure there are a lot, you know, obviously the, in the rural sectors and the productive sectors of the New Zealand economy, they are worried and concerned that too much of it falls on them. Likewise, but there are other parts of the New Zealand economy and urban New Zealand which are thinking that the rural sector needs to pay more. So there's a huge debate that's starting to bubble up. And I think it's a debate that we've got to have. And there's somewhere along the line there has to be some agreement uh, reached. As I say, I don't think it's something we should, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it, it's a good thing. The, what is really interesting over the last sort of three or four weeks on this debate has been the National Party's position on this. And I have to admit to being a little bit surprised. So uh, maybe last year on q and I had Todd Muller and James Shaw sitting together on the desk live for an interview. That was unheard of. They, they, MPs, ministers, they never go on together like that. And there was a sense that there was going to be a bipartisan agreement, a pretty solid one, on the issue of the carbon zero bill. Um, yeah, there was still going to be some, I don't think anyone expected it to, be, it to be as easy when it comes to the ETS and agricultural emissions, but I think there was a sense that there was going to be a pretty tight bipartisan agreement on that and that that would lay the framework and the, you know, the building blocks and then, yeah, there's going to be scraps over emissions and methane targets and all these sorts of things. But I still think National will, will back it, but, but over the last few weeks their rhetoric has certainly been a, a lot more aggressive and I know from the conference, reading the commentary from some of the media reports that some in the National Party are unhappy about uh, National moving too fast on climate change, um, and I think that's, that's pretty interesting. I'm not sure 
that necessarily is Todd Muller. I think his inclination would be to try and get that carbon zero bill through, but it's gone into select committee now. So this is a really, really critical phase for uh, New Zealand politics and the New Zealand economy. And I think Simon Bridges has seen some clear advantage in building a narrative around the cost of living. He's been running some effective social media adverts which have looked to target on the EVs, obviously, um, but also you know, any of these sort of extra costs on the productive sector or extra costs on consumers or on middle New Zealand build into the narrative that he wants to run, which is his argument that it's an unaffordable government. You can't afford Labour, which is the very similar line that was in Australia under that Scott Morrison ran. So it kind of makes sense. I can see it from a political um, analyst uh, or strategist perspective that, that Simon Bridges wants to make some political capital by attacking the government on these extra costs and reminding New Zealanders what he believes are unfair costs or whatever. Uh, I get that. I just think it's a risky strategy as well because I think... Um, as you will all be aware, that the, the, the mood in many parts of the country is uh, increasingly concerned about climate change and increasingly concerned about it uh, from a generational perspective. When I think of uh, certainly my teenagers, but the, a lot of the, the youth protests, the, the mood is one where people do want to see action. Is it an emergency, as this Jacinda Ardern has sort of hinted she's moving towards suggesting it will be, or is it something that's serious, as Simon Bridges says? That's sort of where we've got to. Um, but that's going to be a really interesting political uh, journey over the next few months to figure out whether is National serious about sort of pivoting away a little bit on the bipartisan approach, or is it just having a crack because it wants to get stuck into the government? Is it going to come back? Uh, these are questions I don't know the answers to. But I think it's pretty interesting and uh, is one that we, we need to watch um, pretty carefully. Um, I think the other thing is uh, offering up alternative solutions. And I think one of the ones that has come up for me, which I think is interesting and, and, and I think has some relevance for your industry, is uh, genetic modification, GE, call it whatever it is. For 20 years where it's been pretty much off limits, I actually was a... Young journalist, uh, when the Corngate story broke, the book came out, I mean, it was just chaos. That really rocked a government like I've never seen. And um, Michael Cullen and others were just absolutely furious with that whole process. And they were floundering. They didn't know about the rules. They didn't know anything. And we seems, it seems extraordinary that um, it just sort of put everything on hold for 20 years. Um, but what's interesting about genetic modification is that we've got this new wave coming through, the CRISPR, the, 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 the gene editing stuff, the new, the new forms of, well, some people say is genetic modification, some don't. But it seems that the political, from a Wellington perspective anyway, it seems to me that there is a start of a movement to consider opening up or reviewing some of the rules. So certainly National has, even two years ago, National wouldn't have said this publicly, that they were open to the idea of reviewing the um, tight rules around testing genetic modif mod modified organisms. They are now. James Shaw, I think, has even sort of begrudgingly said that maybe that's something they have to look at. I'm not sure that anyone from the government has yet. Shane Jones has, was a couple of days ago saying the same thing, that he felt that it was something that needed to be explored because New Zealand's missing out on, on opportunities. And obviously, if we're going to tackle uh, the, some of the emissions issues, then we need all the tools available. So it does seem to me that this GE issue is moving. How quickly it moves and how is going to be interesting. And I think... Uh, I think from the, the government is going to want, and I think this is, the government is going to want, desperately want bipartisan support here, and it's going to want as wide a political consensus on changing these rules as possible because it will be extremely nervous about public uh, reaction. If, uh, from my understanding, the, uh, those who are opposed to GMOs don't like the new technology any more than they like the old technology and will fight it as well. So there are regional councils and areas around the country that are declaring themselves GE-free. Um, 
So it's still a really, really live political issue and one which any government is going to tread extremely carefully with. So if national, but if national has said they're open to it, it may be a little bit easier for the government to say yes as well, especially if the Greens are kind of begrudgingly coming on board, if it can be used to eradicate possums as part of the predator-free 2050 or whatever, then that's, uh, that's interesting. But I do think that's a space uh, that we all need to watch and is just starting to move a little bit when we'll see how brave the government is in the next wee while. Uh, the other issue that's coming down the track at your industry is water. Uh, that isn't too far away. David Parker and his water quality, um, his water qu national policy statement on water, that can't be far away. I, I would guess weeks away. Um, and I, if it's David Parker, I've interviewed him on this many times, he'll be pretty tough, but there'll be a, con there'll be a decent consultation period, but uh, they'll be looking for something a bit stronger than weightable water, so there's going to be some, um, some impact, I think, from that, uh, definitely. Uh, when it comes to uh, putting all the climate change stuff aside, and as politically interesting as I think it is, when it comes to the election, I still think that a bigger influence um, come 2020 will be the fortunes of the New Zealand economy, um, which is just in such a really interesting position. It feels like we, it, it feels uneasy. It, it feels as though uh, the economy is trucking along at 2.4%, 2, 2 maybe, uh, is the current sort of estimates and forecasts. Feeling that with interest rate cuts, it'll bounce back up a little bit. Uh, maybe, uh, but it, but the overwhelming feeling of, I, I get from talking to people about the economy is one of uncertainty, even though actually the, many of the fundamentals are good, particularly your industry, the, the meat industry has been, been one of the great uh, parts of, the, of, of an export success story over the last few years, which has really underpinned things. Um, unemployment remains still very low. Immigration, the government didn't really do much with immigration settings. There's still plenty of people coming in the country, um, which is contributing to demand. So there's many positive things there, but there is a great sense of uncertainty. And I know, obviously, many in, in the National Party and many in the business community feel like there are too many uh, new regulations and costs, and that is affecting confidence, and business confidence has obviously been well down in the doldrums. Uh, I can't see that changing any time soon, and there are others on, on the left who will argue that's a, a political bias. Um, but I think, and there is a debate about this too, but I do think it's the, ultimately, it's the... Um, it's the global situation that's worrying everybody, really, and it, um, I think that is the thing that is having the biggest contributing factor. Um, we know that the, uh, the IMF has cut forecasts for the global economy just recently in the last week or so. It's down, to, down into the low threes. There's a feeling that Europe is starting to really struggle, but when you add in uh, the concerns around China just starting to ease off, although still growing, 6% is pretty hard to argue with that really, um, but slowing. Uh, it's just the sense of uncertainty because of Trump and the China, tariff, uh, China trade war and Brexit, and that is leading to this continued sense of uncertainty and a continued um, unease, which is only going to lead to businesses putting off decisions to invest and grow. Um, and so given all that, it probably makes sense uh, that Grant Robertson has run a pretty tight fiscal um, strategy. He, I think he's probably spent about as much as he can spend without risking uh, criticism. F I don't think from the credit, the credit rating agencies, maybe not, but certainly I think he's probably pushed it about as far as he can w and staying to stay within his uh, the budget responsibility rules that he set, and they... So on, that, on the one score, that's very important politically uh, for Labor in terms of their re-election prospects to be able to go to the, camp, to the election campaign next year and say, uh, we have stuck to the fundamentals. Yeah, you might not like us because we've bumped up the minimum wage, we've done this and done, done a few other bits and pieces uh, that, have made, that, that business people may argue has made life more difficult. He can argue, I've stuck to the fundamentals. Um, my, the debt's still around 20%. Yes, I've increased it to 25%, but he'll argue the reason he won't use it, he won't have used it, because he will argue that it is there and his thinking is all about a big global recession coming down the track and that he needs to know that he's got um, the ammunition, the fiscal ammunition, to deal with that 
because interest rates in this country are going down and are probably going to go down to 1% if um, economists are to be believed. So the burden will fall on a government, be it the Labor government or whoever the next government is, potentially to have to stimulate the economy via either infrastructure or increased welfare payments or something. Uh, he knows that that may be a possibility. So I think those things have led to a pretty cautious, uh, by and large, finance minister. We saw a wellbeing budget that, uh, again, laid the frameworks for what they want to do, put in the building blocks, uh, and we'll see next year just how much extra money he is willing, willing to spend. Um, I think that the Trump uh, election cycle is interesting because it's running at exactly the same time as the New Zealand election cycle. And so when I look at the uh, global economy and I look at the things that you guys have been talking about with China and um, the Chinese economy and the tariff wars and the impact that that's having, I just can't th help but look at it politically. I've covered US elections. I was in um, the US for the last Trump election. I just can't help but look at it that everything that Trump's doing is designed to pump up the US economy so that come the middle of 2020, it's, it's really cranking along for US consumers. The, the ones who have kept them in power, you know, who support him and will keep him in power, he, he, will, he needs to deliver the wage gains for those um, American consumers. And so I get up every morning at 3.45 and I turn on CNBC to watch the market news to see what's happening. And I swear every single morning they're either talking about the impact of is there going to be is the China trade deal going to be fixed and if not is the Fed going to cut and if not that's the only two things that seem to be seem to be moving the market one way or the other every morning they're talking about this well we know now that it's likely that the US Fed will cut this week if not once probably again and that is exactly what Trump wanted now whether you can argue I'm not sure you can say directly that Trump forced the US Fed to cut interest rates, but he's, like no other president before, has practically bullied him on Twitter into cutting them. He certainly wants them cut. But certainly the China tariff trade wars have forced the US Fed to cut. So I don't know, you can, put, you can kind of say they're the same thing. Whatever, there's going to be a cut, interest rates are going to go down, that's going to help the US can, uh, drive up demand in the US. Eventually, my thinking is that surely Trump is going to want to cut a deal with China somewhere to give enough time for US businesses to get a bounce back, a spring back in investment and demand um, that will lead into a re-election campaign. So it's hard to see how it's hard to see how the US economy is going to, going to drop in the next year or so. So I think that if that's the case, the big worry remains Europe. Uh, and probably the UK with Brexit. But I think that the New Zealand economy will probably bumble along all right, assuming that Trump manages to do that without it all going pear-shaped. He's gonna, uh, he's, he wants to pump up that uh, economy and keep it flowing. So that will be the driver for growth globally uh, and will cushion uh, the economy in New Zealand. So you've got to think that it, come 2020, the economy will probably be going all right and that will be a huge plus uh, for Labor going into uh, the New Zealand election cycle. Um, I think just a few comments on trade uh, that uh, I think um, I don't want to try and tell a whole bunch of people in the meat industry about stuff that I'm not completely across, but I did go to the, uh, I did go to China with John Key a few times, and I certainly went with him uh, at the, in, during the period where I saw the New Zealand dairy industry um, just go gangbusters in China, and the dairy price go through the roof. And then I also saw it go down, and it uh, was pretty brutal in how quickly it went up and how quickly it went down. And it was a reminder for me at that point, and I and I know John Key and others were worried about it too about the over reliance on China and. You know, we, we see with logs in the last couple of weeks, uh, the log price falling 15, 20% really quickly for no sort of apparent reason. But Chinese demand is obviously a big factor. I know that Chinese demand for meat has been great and is a wonderful success story for this country. And long may it continue because it brings, um, 
it's great for New Zealand. Um, but of course, it comes with, it comes always with that uneasy feeling about then the geopolitical wider relationship between New Zealand and China and the increasingly difficult position that New Zealand must walk of walking the line between the US and China. And we've got China playing a more assertive role in the Pacific and then the US starting to, and some other Western countries taking a harder line, for example, on Huawei and New Zealand not having made a call on Huawei all these issues and these geopolitical issues are floating around. Now, I don't think you can say that China's going to suddenly not going to want to take our food and all those sorts of things. I don't, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that there's always this feeling that um, these are challenging and difficult issues. And I think that uh, it's going to require some really, really impressive work from our diplomats um, over the next few years for New Zealand to c continue to walk this line. And there have been plenty of China experts who are far wiser than me on this stuff who, who think we will struggle to walk that line between keeping China happy and the US happy. And that is something which, unfortunately, we all have to, uh, as uh, New Zealand Inc., have to continually think about um, because it's only going to take one big flare up, Hong Kong, South China Sea, and all of a sudden we're forced into making positions. And I think we saw the government, this government early on, maybe overreach a little bit at times with some of their speeches around defence, upset China. Uh, again, I think the key with, with, with that is not surpri no surprises, good diplomacy, talking, uh, disagreeing when you need to, calling them out on human rights issues when they need to be called out, but uh, it has to be handled properly. <laughs> Can't be just done in a, in a sort of a... Uh, offhand way. It's too important a relationship. Um, I would quickly note too on uh, the US, I've spoken to Winston Peters twice in the last month and a half. He seems absolutely determined to do a free trade deal with the US and has been over there obviously just recently. Uh, I find it a little bit of a stretch to think that uh, New Zealand's got a shit show of getting a, um, a US free trade, bilateral free trade deal at the moment. Um, Good on him for trying. You can't fault him for, for, for trying. But, but this is the same. Um, this is, you know, if, if we were to get to get a free trade deal with the US, we're going to have to make changes to Pharmac. We're going to have to make changes to copyright laws. Uh, is there going to be an investor state clause in there? Uh, I don't know. But these were some of these precisely some of the issues which stopped. Uh, well, certainly saw almost the Labor Party not sign up to the TPP initially when they were in opposition. And you can't help but think that those, issue, those issues would come back if they were to try and do a deal with the US. And of course, Winston Peters didn't even support the Chinese free trade deal. Um, but that doesn't, mean he, that doesn't mean that he's not necessarily doing the right thing for trying. I just uh, think it's pretty interesting that he is. In fact, not just is, but the, the first time he went to Washington, the, the Georgetown speech, I think, speech they call it, in which he failed to run it by the Prime Minister. Um, he practically begged the US to come back into the Pacific and was um, criticised for that speech. And then second time round, it's been a little bit more nuanced. Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting. I don't, I, yeah. There's no harm, I suppose, because um, if there's one message about the trade situation is that diversification has got to be uh, high on the list. And it's encouraging to see uh, progress, hopefully, with the EU trade deal. Um, and uh, eventually, presumably, a UK uh, trade deal once, uh, well, presumably, there is a, some sort of a Brexit, be it hard or otherwise. Um, just a couple of quick comments uh, before I open it up for questions. Um, it's a really great time to be in the media. People might, some people wouldn't, wouldn't say that because uh, it's a difficult time to be in the media because the media uh, landscape is fragmenting. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of pressure and all, and all this sort of stuff. But um, it's, a good, it's a fascinating time to be in the media as a journalist because the story, it's, it's just, uh, it, felt like, it felt like the rules just got ripped up about three years ago, you know, with, with Trump and Brexit and the rise of uh, populism. And um, it's alarming and it wor it's worrying for me personally but to see extremes growing on both sides of the political spectrum, to see the struggle for uh, sort of rational 
coherent arguments in the middle, uh, those voices getting drowned out. But, but it just reinforces the importance of quality uh, journalism, quality media, uh, finding those wherever they are, be it online, radio, TV, whatever, the trusted sources, the people who, who take this stuff seriously. Um, so I've tried to operate in that space, and that, so for that, so it, it's uh, it's never been more important. That's that's what I guess I'm, the point I'm trying to make. And um, so it's a great privilege to be able to be in that space at a time which is um, worrying, but at the same time, uh, I don't know, exciting, invigorating, whatever. It's uh, it's an important time. Um, I'm going to leave it there and uh, take some questions. Oh, I see. Uh, a couple of questions about the coalition party. I sort of made the assumption that Winston Peters is going to be. Mike, Sam. Is it upside down? I can hear you. I can repeat it. Uh, you made the assumption, I think, in terms of what you put forward that Winston Peters will be in for another election. Mm -hmm. uh, second thing around uh, the Greens. So we see the disagreeing of all parties to a certain extent. I have a question about the Greens' ability to continually differentiate themselves from other parties as we go to the next election. Yeah, I think I had something on the Greens. I must have skipped over it. Um, I think that uh, sometimes the debate around Wellington is, you know, that the, that the Greens are getting walked over and that they aren't, you know, that that uh, that the New Zealand First seems to have disproportionately got so much more than the Greens. But the Greens have got some pretty good gains as well, and they've got a story to tell. I think the carbon zero legislation gives them a story to tell. So does the um, ban on uh, or, uh, mining offshore. There's also like potentially likely to be a ban on uh, dock land mining. That's a scrap between New Zealand First and them at the moment. But Eugenie Sage is pretty adamant that she wants all that stewardship land, that dock stewardship land, to be mining free. I mean, they've got they've got plastic bags. I understand what you're saying in the sense that. Labor might try to grab a bit of that as well, you know, and, and own that space as well. But I think they've got a story to tell their supporters, and I think I do think that the Greens have got a locked in five percent. Uh, whether they can, it's whether they can grow up uh, with that story. But they've got a story, um, and I do think that Winston Peters is. I, I've seen nothing to suggest that he's not up for another round. Um, seems to be having too much fun. <laughs> Corin, I think. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm Sam. Yeah, yeah. I'm Sam, another farmer from Waipakura. Um, I, 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 uh, thanks for your, for your sure. gallop around politics, and I missed your dulcet tones on Morning Report this morning. as one of the few people. <laughs> that's that's, kind of I'm, I'm sort of rusted on the AM program. Uh, one of the, and you had a great gallop across the political landscape. One yes. thing you didn't talk about is what's going on in Auckland with Ihu Mato. Sure. Uh, that looks like a really <laughs> difficult equation to be what. solved. What? What? Uh, how many? How many people are going to fall in the swamp there? Uh, that to me is an incredibly. I, I don't know how they're going to solve that. I really don't. Um, I think uh, just a couple of observations. There's one that it's it's bigger than just Ihumatao. I think that there's, it's clear that it's um, captured a, a feeling or a sentiment. It seems to have anyway, from what I've seen. Uh, that's that's wider than perhaps just that piece of land. That a, a younger generation um, of Maori and others. Who, who, who have got some grievances or who feel that, um, that, that there just hasn't been enough done. And I think that that's captured that mood. And just to watch the social media and the way it grew and the way in which uh, the protesters have organised themselves um, suggests that to me. As, as to a solution, there's just going to have to be somebody, it's going to be, I think it's probably going to have to be up to the Labour Māori caucus are going to have to find, if, if Bearing if, if the government has, it keeps getting involved, they're going to be the ones that are going to have to try and resolve it. I, I don't know how they can resolve that. I get the sense that they've got a line they don't want to cross when it comes to what they feel will be, uh, will, will break a precedent on treaty settlements, and so therefore, 
though the Māori and the Labour caucus don't want to cross that line, um, but that's not gonna, that doesn't satisfy the protesters. So I don't know how. So some, somebody is going to have to be extremely creative. And whether that's some sort of a land swap, as somebody mooted, um, I don't know, it might have been Hone Harawera mooted that. Somebody, something like that. But I, it's not, that's not an, I don't know, I don't get the sense that it's um, a foreshore and seabed sort of dispute yet. But, but it's, it's significant. And uh, those protesters, uh, it's significant, Dan, I, but I don't think, I just don't know what, what answer there is. Um, I think the pressure will go back on the Prime Minister when she arrives back in the country about it. But I don't know if she can, she can do much more at the moment. I don't, I don't know. That's a, it's a thorny one. That's for sure. Thank you, uh, Corin Roger Barton. Uh, like Sam, a sheep farmer. Excellent. I'm going to take you back slightly to the uh, late seventies. SMPs, land development encouragement loan, money thrown at farmers from all directions, well one direction actually from the government. Um, my question really is what's the difference between Trump's antics and Jonesy running around the uh, provincial areas in New Zealand with his provincial growth fund throwing money at us? Now to reflect on the early 80s, the on-farm inflation in 1982-83 was 22%. Now I know the political and economic landscape is hugely different now to what it was then. But as soon as you throw free money at people, they have less regard for it. And do you think Wellington actually understands what throwing free money into the provinces is doing in terms of distortion? Thank you. Well, Provincial Growth Fund is I think coming up, and credit to Paul Goldsmith and his role as the National Party's uh, spokesman on that issue has come under, you know, I mean I think it's fair to say Shane Jones's every single move is watched pretty closely now uh, in terms of what money he is doling out. So I know that up to $20 million it doesn't require much more than the three ministers to, you know, basically just say they want to do it. Uh, I think that I think that the proof will be in the, I don't think we've seen, I don't think we can make a judgment on that yet. I mean obviously there's some politi there's politics in it, but I don't think we can make a, a final judgment on the success of it um, until we see the each individual project. Um, but it's difficult because um, I think when you throw forestry in the mix as well, and there's all of a sudden a whole lot of complicated issues around forestry and if you look in Wairoa and places like that where a lot of concern now around carbon capture forests and, and what's going on with the billion dollar trees. I don't know, I think it's probably a bit soon to say that, every, that, that what he's spent is, is wasted. I don't think you can say that. But it will need to be held to account. There will need to be decent evaluations to see whether these projects have stacked up. And I think it is beholden on the media and on the opposition to hold, keep holding them to account on every single dollar he spends, uh, on every single project, uh, to make sure that there is some value for money. I mean, the one I was talking to him about a week or so ago was the airports, and he, to be honest, he was pretty blunt. He was just didn't care that much. He, he was like, I want these regional airports uh, to be boosted. Um, I'm going to do it. They need it. Uh, I would have, I don't know, for those regional communities that have a pretty strong claim on, on, on that, wouldn't they, given the money that goes in other places? I don't know. I'm sorry, that's not a great answer, but it's uh, probably the best I can do. Thank you, Brilliant. Okay, well, we'll, we'll wrap that up here. Yep. But look, thank you very much, Corin, for your um, sharing with us your, your really deep understanding of that political landscape and, and in particular the um, the understanding of the various positions of, of all the parties that are out there. Because before we know it, we will be. You will be. Before you know it. And this is all important stuff. So I thank good. you very, very much. And thank you. A um, highly nutritious, protein-rich yes. gift yes. Um, from both uh, Ansco and Silverfield Farms. So enjoy. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Cheers.